Pam, when I interviewed you uh, uh, back in the primary, uh, before you won your, pri your primary, uh, you had uh, had a lot of things that you were talking about, but I, I think I remember in general that you were really highlighting job creation, a lower taxes for the Hudson Valley region. Can you expand with to that to the people here tonight and sure. the people out in the cable? Sure, Kevin, and, and let me just start by thanking the Joint Chambers for uh, this really wonderful public service. Uh, it's just terrific that we have the opportunity in the course of uh, the election process to uh, speak in an uninhibited environment and have an exchange of views. Um, it's no news to anybody in this room or in this audience or in this region that we've had a tremendous hit on our economy in the Hudson Valley in the last several years. Uh, markets in the expanding global economy have forced our principal employers to trim their sales and thousands of people in the Hudson Valley have been laid off. Thousands upon thousands. Estimates vary. At this point, we're generally working with the figure of over 10,000 people in the last two and a half years alone, and some people are uh, anxious that there's no end in sight. Uh, clearly, in the interest of our population, in the interest of our families, in the interest of our communities, job creation has to be our number one priority. And it has to be the number one focus of the next congressman uh, from the Hudson Valley. Uh, I believe that there's a great deal that you can do uh, as a member uh, in the House to uh, help to stabilize the national economy. And the first thing that I would do uh, is to emphasize deficit reduction. Uh, deficits inherited from previous administrations skyrocketing into the 300 billion range uh, have crippled our capacity in this country, both regionally and nationally, to grow dynamically toward the end of this decade and on into the next century. We've got to bring these deficits down. We've got to bring these budgets into some semblance of balance so that we can get our fiscal house in order. Now, in that process, you're going to increase the savings rate. You're going to increase the pool of available uh, capital to invest. You're also going to help assist the private sector with capital formation. And in general, you're going to increase and improve the standard of living. You're also going to free up money for critical investments in human capital, job training, improving the capacity of our workers to meet the demands of tomorrow's workplace. In infrastructure, one of the critical areas in the Hudson Valley, we've got to improve our infrastructure so that areas which we want to channel growth toward can sustain the kind of uh, requirements that new employers will have. Uh, we also need to invest in new technologies and the technologies that are going to drive this economy uh, as we look forward to the future. So that would be a, a, an absolutely essential area that I would focus on. And it's an area that I draw a distinction uh, with my opponent, uh, who has supported the uh, Contract for America, which calls for uh, massive revenue reductions and uh, uh, spending increases estimated over $800 billion over a five-year period, which will just be devastating to our efforts to get our deficits under, under control. There are a lot of things that we can do in the Hudson Valley regionally with federal assistance to stimulate job creation. Uh, one of the most exciting things, I think, as we look around are, are the uh, business development centers. We look up in uh, Dutchess County. We have a number of centers there where housed under one roof are new and emerging companies, 25, 30 companies. These are proprietary. They're up from the garage, the living room. Uh, they're people who've been laid off who are starting new careers. <coughs> they're people who live here. They're people who send their kids to school here. Uh, they're people who, when they graduate from the incubator, are going to stay here. They're not going to North Carolina. They're going to be part of the sustainable indigenous economy that's going to build, help us build uh, the Hudson Valley. Uh, these centers have shared resources. They have cutting edge communications technologies. They have uh, terrific uh, uh, computerization. They have instruction in entrepreneurship. Not all these people who are losing their jobs in mid-career have much entrepreneurial background. Many of them were in, in quite paternalistic uh, employment. Uh, situations and uh, have to, in effect, learn how uh, to be uh, self-reliant in business. It's quite a, a uh, personality shift that they have to go through in order uh, to continue to pay their mortgages and send their kids to school and do all the things that they'd always been doing. So I, I'd be very supportive of, of uh, expanding uh, uh, these centers. I think they, they show a great promise for our area. I also think that 
we need to adapt uh, the technologies to the workplace that will assist our medium and uh, small businesses to compete uh, in these uh, emerging global markets. We need to take uh, the burdens off small and medium-sized businesses that have been imposed by government, uh, reduce uh, the, some of the uh, tax responsibilities, some of the bureaucratic paper load, try to ease access to credit for, for our smaller companies. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, you know, this can go into more of an uh, encyclopedic mm -hmm. detail, but you get the sense of, of what I feel uh, could be the mission of an effective uh, representative in Washington. Thank you, Ham. In your district, you probably have pro the largest percentage of in your people is probably senior citizens. I'm just taking a guess, or people approaching that age. The federal government has a law right now with Social Security recipients that they really penalize those people that want to work after age 65. And we are living a lot longer now. One of those penalties is that if you make, I believe it's $11,000 or more a year, for every dollar you earn over that figure, we will take $2 from your Social Security check. Is that a viable plan or is that something that can be changed or do you think that these people should keep their money because they earned it after working for 45 years and not be penalized at all. I think that Social Security is something that you work and you earn, and I think you're entitled to it. I don't think the government should tax it, and I don't think they should have any right to take it away. And I think that very viable people ought to be allowed to go ahead and work. And I don't think they should be penalized for and be forced out of, of a, an economy where they could be very useful in many, many ways. I would not have supported any of the ideas of Clinton, of Clinton the Clinton plan to uh, increase the Social Security tax, unlike my opponent, who does, I believe, back what President Clinton has wanted to do with the Social Securities and, and the uh, tax and the seniors. I think we really need to support our seniors as much as possible, and that includes a lot of other things, areas involving health benefits and so forth that people have been eyeing with the idea of means testing and taxing. I think that's wrong. The right. question right. we raised the uh, ceiling on outside income for uh, uh, for our seniors, uh, I think that, that uh, particularly as <clears throat> we see uh, our seniors uh, getting older uh, but remaining uh, able-bodied and uh, able to contribute, uh, I, and, and also uh, because so many of them are on fixed incomes, uh, that uh, they ought to have the, ca the capacity and the right, I think, to uh, earn uh, additional income, uh, if, if uh, as much as anything else, to pay the additional cost uh, of living that uh, we incur in our, uh, uh, you know, inflationary uh, environment. Um, I think uh, we have a special compact with uh, American seniors. Uh, it's a heritage which uh, I'm very proud of uh, in the Democratic Party, uh, initiatives uh, uh, which we took uh, generations ago and which we fought for uh, against repeated efforts to undermine it. Um, uh, I would honor that compact uh, vigilantly. Thank you very much. Joe? We shouldn't penalize people for wanting to be productive. So obviously uh, the incentives should be for people to work, not to not work. Uh, so therefore, you know where I stand on that issue. But let me say two things about the Social Security system. Because there's been a lot said in two generations about what, what Social Security is, and many people have been elected on those promises. So I would say that any changes that are contemplated to Social Security must begin with the people who are entering the workforces now, that no one should tamper with the rules as they were advertised and the promises that were made because too many people are depending upon those. Their expectations have been molded uh, over many years. One other point I should make is that it's nice to talk, ladies and gentlemen, about Social Security, but it's fast becoming a bankrupt system. And you don't have to be a CPA to see that coming. <laughs> With the graying of America, by the year, I believe it's uh, 2010, there'll be more people working relative, or excuse me, retiring relative to working. It's called the graying of America. And the problem we have, especially under the Democrat Congresses, uh, Mr. Carter put the Social Security tax rate and based on automatic pilot, so that during the 80s, there was a very, very substantial increase in Social Security taxes. Now, that may not be the problem in and of itself, because income taxes did go down. What they did, though, 
is they didn't put those Social Security taxes in the Social Security Trust Fund. They took $800 billion paid in, advertised as Social Security taxes, and used it on other programs to reduce the deficit. So if you thought the deficit was bad, it would have been worse had they left that money in the Social Security Trust Fund. That's right. So I would tell you that before we get into academic discussions about what we may or may not do, there may not be any money in the Social Security Trust Fund when the people who earn that money get to that place without imposing a tragic, onerous, unbelievable tax burden on the next generation to replace that money that we took from those accounts. And this is an issue that has to be looked at because it's intergenerational fraud. It's one of the reasons I wrote the book. Someone's got to deal with it. And in me, you've got someone who has experience in the private sector, so no one's gonna put the wool over my eye. I've got experience as a congressman, but besides that, I've got the energy and I've got a loud mouth. Okay. I'm gonna be the Paul Revere to sound the bell until this system is straightened out. Okay, because you got a loud mouth, we're gonna stay with you, okay? <laughs> Next question is okay. for you. Unfortunately, it's the federal government that gets the blame for a lot of our ills. For example, tonight we had uh, county legislatures and county executives who blame the state. We have state people who blame the federal government. Biggest problem we have, one of the many problems that we have, we do have a lot of right going with this country too, by the way, but another problem that we have in this country is that we have the problem of our real estate taxes paying for, our home properties taxes paying for the schools. The schools are getting short funded constantly. We go to the county, the county says that they're short funded from the state. The state says that they're short funded from the federal government. Everyone's school taxes keep on going up. Now it seems to be a national problem where it's less expensive <clears throat> to run a whole town than it is to run a school. How do we solve this problem of the constant going up of taxes in the schools, going up, going up? How do we get more money from the federal government to offset these tremendous increases in our taxes for the schools? The first thing you must do is look at the cost of education in New York State and ask yourself, why does it cost so much per pupil in this state to educate our kids? And then that leads to an analysis that would tell you that the money that has gone into education, because we look at the performance records, we see scores going down, is obviously not going into educating our children. It's going into administration. It's going into overhead. It's going into things that do more for political patronage, directly and indirectly, than for our children. Now, what would be the answer? I have a simple answer. I started a foundation, Truth in Government. One of the first things we did is a videotape, 28 minutes, using computer, using computer graphics to teach <coughs> or educate the American people about why an experiment with a voucher system is a good idea. Not that you can just change the system overnight, but just take 25% of the money that is now going directly into those school systems, put it back into the pockets of the people who pay those taxes, the parents, the consumers of that service, and let them decide where they want to send their children. Bring competition to the public school system and add in the private school system as well, and you'll see with that competition what happens. What did the post office do when Federal Express decided to compete with the post office on overnight mail? They, they, advertised, they advertised on cable TV. Well, what they do, <laughs> they, they got into the business and they did a good job in competing. And they offered now the public uh, you know, choices. Uh, and by the way, people say, well, this is indirectly government sponsoring private schools. What did we do with the GI Bill? The GI Bill was money that we gave GIs and we said, now, you take that money and you go to a school to get educated. Some went to Fordham University, you could say that's a private school, and some went to public schools. There's nothing wrong with that. So what I'm saying is, let's bring competition. We have increased the tax burden on the property owners, and I hear it from my mother every day. She's 81, she still has the three bedroom house that we bought in 1957 when we moved from the Bronx to Lower Westchester County, and she wants to stay there. It's becoming 
a real burden. The taxes back in 1957 were less than $1,000. Now they're over $10,000. The interest on her certificates of deposit have gone down from 8% down to 2%, and she's now really feeling it. Uh, so she, she complains about this, but she's not unique. There are many senior citizens, I hear it all the time, that do not want to move into apartments, do not want to move to Florida or Texas. They want to stay here, and they can't because they're being bankrupted by the school taxes. So let's bring accountability. Accountability means let's see how we're spending this money. And if it's not going into educating the kids, we've got to get that out of the budget. Number two, let's bring competition. Let the free marketplace work. It works very well. That's what America is all about, and you'll see how the cost of education will go down. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't see uh, really the same results from that prescription. I don't know if you have an opportunity to just comment on this question. It's a central question uh, it's to your our, time to right our now. region. Uh, you know, I, I, I think cost accountability is important, certainly, but anybody in this uh, room or in this audience who's worked in the school board or in the school system in the Hudson Valley, and that sooner or later means most of us, knows what tremendous pressure uh, our boards are under from the communities to cut back on costs. And, uh, they, and you know from the uh, very high number of budgets which are defeated uh, how sensitive our boards are uh, to this concern. Um, the reality is that we have higher enrollment, we have aging plants, we have tremendous upward pressure on the cost of, of education. And here in Putnam County, we have, of course, problems associated with other factors which have an impact on our school budgets. We have the problem of a uh, lingering recession, which we, we've had such a difficulty getting out of. We have the problem of the downsizing with result of unemployment and corresponding impact on the communities. We have the problem of this very adverse situation with the watershed, where we're not able to uh, develop our, our, our lands uh, to, to their uh, maximum capacity. And as a consequence, uh, we're being squeezed. We're being terribly squeezed. One of the things the federal government needs to do is to reduce its deficit so that we can provide funds for investment so we can grow. Uh, another thing I think that is very important to look at are alternatives to property tax, which is where you started with this question, uh, f for school funding. It's happening around the country. There are experiments in place. Uh, there are hybrid experiments. There are radical alternative experiments. Uh, I think we ought to be paying very close attention to them because it's no question in my mind uh, People in our communities who do not have the capacity to increase their incomes at the same rate as the charges that are coming at them are going to be squeezed out of living here. And this uh, very serious problem of people raising their children in a community where their children are not going to be able to live themselves as adults is going to be, t is going to be prevalent. Uh, and I, I think this is a, you know, a situation that's on the verge of being an emergency. One of the first things I would do is go down and make sure that the f mandates that have been passed and where, the, where they were promising us funding get their full funding at the level at which they were supposed to be passed. There is a public law that was passed with a promise of 40% unfunded, 40% funding in the, in the mandate. That public law is presently funded at only at 3.5%. The rest has to come out of our pockets. There's a lot of things that have to be done, and one of the things that really has to be done is somebody has to stand up and shout long and loud against all this unfunded mandate off budget kind of item that comes out of the federal government. Uh, Ham, Hammy's sitting here talking about reducing the deficit. You reduce the deficit if you reduce the size of government. You've got to start somewhere to cut taxes and the way you do that is cut the size of government. You get the government out of, of doing things it shouldn't be doing and make sure that if they pass something that they're going to promise to fund, that they fund it at the level that they're supposed to. There's a lot of things that need to be done in terms of our education. We've got to raise a, a standards in our schools. We can no longer afford the luxury of training children in such a way that when they graduate, they have a diploma that they can't even read. We should have some kind of a standard system. If it doesn't come out of the school system itself, then we all go we're going to have to do something to look at it from a, a, a uh, total national, national uh, view. I think we need mostly, though, to empower our local communities to do what they know is the right thing to do with their public schools. We need to support them. I am all for community empowerment.
I think magnet schools are a terrific idea. I think there's a lot of ways we can creatively use the money that we're putting into education, and I'd like to see us fund education at a much higher level. But I really am talking about here a very basic difference. I don't I think the most, I think the most important thing that I have really in terms of my, my education agenda is that I'd like to see us get more bang for our buck. I want to make sure that we're putting out, when we put out a dollar, we get a dollar's value in return. And I'd much rather see the money go into the schools rather than into the administration costs. So I think there are ways that we can get a lot more for our money. But I think that the communities know best how to do that, and I'd like to let them have a lot more empowerment from the federal level and enable them to do that. Okay. Hey, can I come in on this briefly? Is that uh, it would be, we require a comment from everybody to, to respond. And I welcome that. Then, then I could open up the floor to have Catherine respond and Joe respond. Fine. I, I just think that this response that you just gave is uh, really uh, emblematic of the problem of your, of your whole campaign. In, in one answer, you, you actually contradicted yourself about four times. You said you wanted to uh, fulfill these uh, unfunded mandates for education. Then you said that you were opposed to uh, unfunded mandates and you were going to get rid of them. Uh, then you said the way you shrink government is by uh, cutting taxes. Um, uh, you know, it, it doesn't take uh, one of the people in these uh, stressed out schools to know, uh, elementary schools, uh, that when you uh, cut revenues across the board without cutting spending, uh, you have increased deficits. And when you have increased deficits, you got stagnation, you got too much debt, and you don't grow as a nation. This is a, a very fundamental problem that we're grappling with here, and it's, it's uh, uh, you know, c very common election season uh, kind of uh, strategy to come out with uh, promises of cuts everywhere, but there has to be some corresponding honesty uh, uh, about how you're going to cut spending. Now, with respect to the capital gains uh, proposal that we heard about earlier, I thought that if wasn't you, part of the topic. No, it, it is I will give you time to respond. It's, to it's it. very much part of it. Yeah. The, the, the capital gains cut that, that, that nobody but uh, Mrs. Kelly is proposed that I know of, uh, it calls for a 100% elimination of capital gains. Now, most people, like myself and others who are interested in trying to reduce capital gains uh, uh, burdens, think in terms of targeted cuts, uh, which uh, channel uh, investment capital in areas which need uh, investment and growth. Think of indexing capital gains so as to take the burden off uh, some of the people who have uh, uh, made profits but who are not uh, putting their capital in, back into the markets because they're, they're, oh, they're overtaxed. But nobody is suggesting that we take 100% of capital gains and eliminate the tax altogether, which causes $25 billion hits per year for several years on the federal deficit without any corresponding revenue, because the revenue doesn't kick in for a while because investment doesn't create profits that are then taxed accordingly. Uh, you know, again, not very complicated, but widely uh, known as uh, a matter of uh, pretty irresponsible social policy. Okay. Joe, you have three minutes. Catherine, you have three minutes. And Sue, you can wrap it up with her. I don't know like what I'm respond? responding to, but... Okay. Uh, Would you like to make any comments at all about okay. Ken's response well, to Sue? Uh, was I, I think you've heard just two very confused uh, analyses about what the world is all about. It sounds like we have two professors here. Uh, we, we need to get common sense back into uh, Washington, and I don't think you heard common sense from either one of them. Uh, certainly experience counts, and, and you, you know that I'm the only one with that experience uh, sitting up here. But let me comment on something that should have been mentioned by each of you, uh, and that's uh, the Clinton proposal for Goals 2000. You know, everybody talks about the Clinton health care plan. Did you forget the Clinton education plan that has been authorized? It is a, a plan that would take away from the neighborhoods the power that you're talking about. Rather than a confused discourse about you know, how we look at mandates, we gotta look at what Clinton is trying to do. He's trying to impose a new federal bureaucracy on education. I applaud uh, Mrs. Lowe for what she said. It takes courage, and I would support that. We should dismantle the Department of Education because it hasn't done anything. It's created a, a monstrous bureaucracy. By the way, let me give you, I see too many serious faces here, my definition of the bureaucracy. Are you ready? It's the process of turning energy into solid waste. That's what I witnessed four years in Washington, and that's what will continue if you elect the kinds of thinking that you, you just heard. So, number one, you must understand that there is an agenda in Washington that's gonna be pushed. 
one of the biggest lobbies we have in this country besides the trial attorneys, let's get down to Main Street and the brass tacks, is guess what? The NEA, the teachers unions, they have too much power. That is why you've seen, that's right, let's clap on that one because it's the truth. And, and that's why you've seen the costs increase because it's this union that takes your monies from your property taxes and creates a principal and assistant principal from the first to the third grade, one from the third to the fifth grade. Uh, Lord knows how many administrators we have because they're protecting <coughs> their friends. And, and this is what they're doing, they're educating our kids. So let's watch out for this other freight train coming down. Everybody's had their eye on health care, goals 2000. It's no good because what they're saying is we're going to value our education about what we put into the system. How much we're spending on teachers, how much we're spending on programs. Nonsense. Evaluate the program like business does by the result. What are the scores? If the scores are not going up, that means the program stinks, number one. Number two. Make it faster. The capital faster. gains tax. Again. Now. I don't want to talk like a, uh, a tax accountant, but I was a tax partner at Arthur Anderson for 12 years. It makes no sense to reduce the capital gains tax to zero. Why doesn't it make any sense to do, it, to do that? We must reduce it. Okay. There's no question. Because nobody will pass it. If you reduce it to zero, that means that the billions that you're getting right now from this high capital gains tax at 28% have to be replaced with dollars someplace else until the jobs factor kick in. There's no question that jobs will be created. But why not reduce it under my plan Make to 10%? Question. By doing that, you do free up the capital, you do create the jobs, and you at least have some revenue in the process. I, I can't <laughs> understand how Ham can call my wanting to cut taxes bad social policy. There isn't anybody in this room that doesn't know that economically we've been really hit hard. What we really need in this area is jobs. And tax cuts can help because we're carrying a huge tax burden. The reason that they, that neither Joe nor Ham seem to want to, to stand behind cutting taxes is because obviously neither one of them can understand what I'm talking about, about a smaller, smarter government. If you shrink government, you don't need those tax dollars. You can keep them in people's pockets. One of the things I've been calling for since I started this campaign is a 2% across the board cut in the, in the budget of every single federal agency. 2% is nothing. That would put $500 back in the pocket of every single family paying taxes. Now, as far as the unfunded mandates go, I'm 100% against them. But for those that we already have on the books and aren't going to be having any effect with, then what we have to do is fund them at what we promised everyone in this nation we would fund them at. If we promise 40%, we should fund them at 40%, not three and a half. If we can get them off the books, fine. I don't think that anyone, I certainly don't live outside my budget. I'm a small businesswoman, and I certainly have never been able to run a business off budget the way the government seems to run its business. I'm anxious that the government learn a lesson and learn to live within its means. We have too many people, there's 435 people down there who too frequently look at the budget as though it's a cookie jar and feel like they're going to grab everything in, of, out of theirs. We can cut our budget, and when we cut our budget, we can cut the deficit and we can cut people's taxes. And the only way we can do that is by cutting expenditure items and cutting the exp expenses the, the way government is, the federal government is throwing money around. There's all kinds of things down there in the budget that make no sense at all. There's a $60 million line item for something called the industrial heritage, uh, um, I believe it's the, the support of industrial heritage, uh, and it, it's a line item that goes directly to the state of Pennsylvania and no one from the federal government that I've been able to talk, fi find has any idea what they do with that $60 million. It doesn't go to anybody but the state of Pennsylvania. Wouldn't you like to have an extra $60 million here in the United States? Wish there's, I lived there. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of budget items like that that really need to be addressed. Talk and the $800 okay. million okay. That we spent Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. On the Write it on your card, please, sir. All right. Uh, well, there, well, 
Let, uh, let me just answer one question. One, one, I don't know exactly what your question was, but I can tell you one of the ways I'd cut taxes is I'd look long and hard before I'd spend close to a billion dollars invading half an island in order to prop up a puppet government. I don't think I would do that. I think that's one way of saving taxes. You've the biggest single problem that we have is, go is that nobody knows where all our money is coming from when they do this kind of thing. Clinton was asked where the money came for the invasion, and he said he, didn't clearly, he clearly did not know. Well, the people who run government ought to know. They ought to know how much money they have and how much they can spend. Okay, what I'd like to do is jump over to Ham. Ham, we're going to give you about two or three minutes. It's not a closing statement, but I want to give you two or three minutes to, to ask you this question. I know you're anxious, if everyone else is here, when they get to Congress, they want to work for the constituency. If Ham Fish goes to Congress, what will you do differently, or what would you do better when you become Congress to make this a better place for all of us? Well, uh, let me say first that one of the things that I'm proudest about in my life is the uh, tradition of public service that uh, has been uh, established by members of my family for many generations uh, in the Hudson Valley. And uh, I learned a great deal in particular from my dad, who uh, I think strikingly always used to say that when people came through the door, he never asked you know, what party are you in, or where are you coming from? It's how can I help you? And uh, I think that most people uh, recognize in Hudson Valley that for many, many years uh, uh, we've been privileged to have really one uh, of the great members of uh, Congress, not just uh, in this time, but any time. And uh, certainly as I've gone around uh, campaigning in the last uh, five or six months, I've uh, crossed the, my father's career path many, many, many times here in Putnam and in Dutchess. And it's always the same. It's always uh, how sorry they are to see him go and uh, uh, what it meant to have uh, a member of Congress who was totally and selflessly devoted to his constituency. And I think it would be, a, uh, frankly, uh, uh, a pretty uh, hard act to follow and a difficult one to improve on. Um, <clears throat> however, uh, I'm a Democrat, and uh, I think that there are challenges that we face as a country, which are new challenges, that require new ideas uh, and new energy. Uh, I've been working in the international arena, in the international business and human rights field uh, for a number of years. Uh, I've seen as the end of the Cold War has contributed to a realignment of global markets, uh, I've seen the future, and the future is international global economic competition. That's where uh, our future stake resides. And we have to position ourselves as a country uh, to compete effectively uh, in this global economy, uh, and particularly in order to maintain our uh, position as the premier global economy. Uh, to do that, uh, we've got to invest in growth. We've got to invest in new technologies. We've got to invest in young people in their education. Uh, we've got to in work with the private sector to help create jobs, uh, to uh, build the new industries uh, that are going to uh, drive us through the end of the decade and beyond. And it's particularly true in the Hudson Valley, where we've taken uh, such a hit uh, from the kind of downsizing uh, and the really disabling effects of uh, reliance on uh, single source uh, employers. Uh, so I think that uh, investment in <coughs> technologies, an orientation toward uh, the shape of the new economy, an understanding and a recognition of uh, what is needed and how we should uh, help our society channel its development and help our citizens to uh, prepare themselves uh, is the prescription for uh, a thriving and prosperous uh, stable America and hopefully a stable and peaceful world. And I, I very much hope to be a part of this process. Well, I <clears throat> certainly agree with Ham about his father and his grandfather. I knew both a great uh, tradition. In fact, I, I work with both. Uh, his grandfather was actually a, a captain of the 369th uh, uh, Division back in World War I. And we worked together on getting a Congressional Medal of Honor for a uh, a World War I hero, a black American. No black American had ever gotten a Congressional Medal of Honor in World War I or World War II. In fact, both his father and grandfather endorsed me in 1988. 
I guess what I would say in, in a short period of time is we have to look at the environment in which this district operates. It's in a place called New York State. You know what happened to New York State in 1992? It lost three members of Congress. It went from 34 to 31. California picked up seven, Florida picked up four, Texas picked up one. You know what that means? We're gonna lose our leverage, we're losing our power more and more in the Northeast, certainly in New York State. How do you make up for that? Well, look at my record. What did I do when I went down there, realizing that we had problems in two great bodies of water, the Hudson River and the Long Island Sound, different problems. Uh, we had a lack of oxygen in the Hudson, uh, in the Long Island Sound. We had PCBs here. I immediately saw the need, using my business sense, to form a coalition. So I formed two caucuses. I went to Congressman Bruce Morrison on the South Shore in New Haven, and I went to Bob Torricelli and made sure that we got Democrats and Republicans, especially a couple of members like Morazic and others on the Appropriations Committee, so that in a short period of time, we were able to bring in the money needed to fix those bodies of waters up. As a congressman represented one district, you can do very little. But if you use that kind of imagination and that kind of energy, you can do a lot. That's what I will do for this district. So, if elected to Congress, you have about a minute, minute and 30 seconds to tell us what you would do better to make this a better place for us. If I'm elected to Congress, I would make this, base, uh, this place a better place for us to live by going in there and working very, very hard to do everything I can to make government smaller and make it smarter. There's a basic difference that you see here that people need to look at very carefully. I'm talking about reduction in government. I'm not talking about government imposed things. I'm talking about the difference between people who are supporting Clinton's health care plan, which I don't support, but Hamfish does. I'm talking about a balanced budget, which I support, but Hamfish does not. I'm talking about about bringing the federal, uh, excuse me, creating a climate here in this region where people can actually function. I'm a small businesswoman. I want to reduce taxes so that people can function here. What you have that buys you power economically is the money you have in hand. And every time you give up a dollar bill to the government, every dollar you give to the government is a piece of your economic power. Our region has given too much to the government. We're not getting enough back. I want it back here, and that's what I would do. I think my background uh, says it all. I'm the son of immigrants. My dad came here in uh, 1929 with a fourth grade education from Italy, poor a farming family, um, and he worked hard. He taught me to work hard. He taught me to save. And I think that's evident by what I did with my life. When we moved to Westchester County, I got a job at Elmwood Country Club and Abe Levine's Lodge Mart Lodge, working my way through college as a waiter. I never had a weekend off for four years. In fact, the only days I had off in the summer were Mondays when the places were closed. I then began my career, having done very well at Fordham University. They picked me as an intern at Arthur Anderson. Ten years later, I was made a partner, and 12 years after that, I decided to run for Congress at the age of 43 and surprised a lot of people by being elected in a very tough Democrat district as a conservative Republican. Uh, that was proven by the fact that Bella Abzug moved in from Greenwich Village and I had to send her back in 1986. Now, um, <laughs> we've heard a lot of talk about conservatism here, but let me tell you, I'm the real conservative here. Just look at my record and you'll see that. After leaving Congress, I didn't go to get a fat job. I didn't go back to accounting. I didn't become a lobbyist. Five seconds. I became a human rights activist, and I became an author because I wanted to apply my experience in Congress to the public. It's time for me now to go back with that wonderful experience, what America gave my family, what my family gave to me, to bring it back to represent you so that we can really make this district something to be proud of. Thank you very much. Thank you, and good luck in the election. Sue? Um, all of the three people he, sitting here with me have run for Congress in another district. And I want people in this area to realize that I have lived here for 35 years. I've raised four kids in this district. I'm the woman who opened Hamilton Fish, Congressman Hamilton Fish's offices in Westchester and Putnam. I feel very strongly that we need somebody who's lived here a long time, who cares about this region. I'm not a professional politician. I'm here because I care, because I 
My husband and I have earned everything we've ever gotten. We started life with $200 in an old used car. And everything we've ever gotten, we've made ourselves. And I think that's what's happened with most people in this region. And I think we're all suffering because of the taxes and the red tape and problems. I want to change that. That's why I want to go to Congress, because I am very different, and I'm not a professional politician. I think I can do it. Thank you. And Correction. You. I did not run for Congress in another district. I ran in a primary in this district okay. first time two years ago. Doesn't Correct. make me a okay. professional politician okay. either. Correct. Correction accepted. Ham, you'll wrap it up, please. I, I think uh, Mrs. Kelly's presentation is just riddled with errors, and I'm sorry that we don't have more time to try to distinguish the rhetoric from the reality, but uh, just for the record, uh, uh, proposals that she's endorsed and described by the Wall Street Journal as blue smoke and mirrors and deficit busting, and, and nobody can be seriously for a balanced budget with those proposals. Uh, in the course of the campaign, the last five or six months, I've debated on television and public probably a dozen times on the health care issues, and my health care plan is on a matter of public record, and everybody in this area knows that I do not support the Clinton health care plan. My description of her capital gains proposal as bad social policy is, relates to her capital gains proposal, not uh, to cutting capital gains or to cutting taxes generally, as she has suggested. Uh, I have worked in the public interest sector for over 20 years. I grew up in the Hudson Valley. I've managed medium-sized business. I've created good union jobs. I've managed projects in the millions of dollars. I won an Academy Award for a film on anti-Semitism. I did run for Congress uh, in the lower third of this district in 1988. And for the last four years, I've been That's an advisor it. to uh, premier international uh, human rights organization. I'm raising my family here in Putnam County. I have two little girls. My wife and I live over in the western part of the county. Uh, I believe that I can be an effective voice on behalf of the people in the 19th Congressional District. And I ask you to send me to Washington in November. Thank you. Thank you, and good luck at your election. To all four candidates, I know it was a long day for you and a long night. It's after midnight. So on behalf of everybody here, on behalf of all your constituency, it was very nice of you to take out your time for a long day and wind it up here in Putnam County after midnight. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. We this up now. You've been watching CTEC Cable Channel 8. On behalf of the Putnam County Association of Chambers, we want to thank everyone for attending tonight. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope that it was informative. We will, we will be playing all these tapes back up to Election Day so that people who missed them or missed parts of them can watch them on cable TV. And we thank all the candidates once again. Thank you for coming.